Welcome to another edition of Showtime with Food. Insightful BS by my Laker teammates and a whole lot of BS by NBA legends. And uh, today's show is a little special one. I want to talk about, uh, uh, Nick, the one thing I want to talk about is I hate when players compare each generation or, or each decade, each decade with a decade with a decade, and we come to the current position now to where you have uh, great players, LeBron, Curry, Durant, just to name a few. But it's so unfair. Well, you know what I'm going to say? This J.J. Reddick, this kid here, you know, this kid here who's a journeyman, played for six different teams. All his accolades came in college, played 15 years in the NBA, was being shifted around from team to team because all he could do was shoot. And he wasn't that great of a shooter. He was a poor man, Danny Ainge, because Steph is being played more physical. They got his hands on. In today's NBA, I don't know what game he's looking at. It's, it, I, you can't touch the guy. Anytime you touch anybody, a three-point shooter, come close to them when they're landing, it's a foul. J.J. Reddick needs to be quiet and stop trying to compare. I think he's gotten out of this what he wants to, is that his name being thrown around and the attention and all that. But you know what? It's attention that he's not going to want because a lot of former players, myself just as one, along with Dominique, talk about this guy who's a poor man, Jeff Hornacek, uh, a guy that uh, – uh, you know, why would he even say that? And when all he got, and when he's talking about that, you got you can't say that by watching game film. You have to talk to the players that lived it. I lived that 80s era. And Larry Bird was one of the greatest three-point shooters that's ever played this game. Fuck percentages. It ain't about that. It's about hitting big shots, things that he couldn't do as a player without getting a pick set for him. So, uh, you know, when people compare each generation, and I appreciate and love basketball, I enjoy each decade. You know, I have so much respect going all the way back to the 60s and watching Bob Cousy. That's where it started. Cousy. That's where it started with Reddick. Not to interrupt you, but about six months ago or a year ago, Reddick was calling Bob Cousy a plumber who couldn't dribble with his left hand. Well, he got a lot of nerve to say that about Bob Cousy. He could barely dribble with his left hand, with his right hand. And that was the best hand he had, J.J. Reddick. Couldn't get open without a pick being set. So, you know, that guy, man, it's it's sad because um, you, you have to have respect from where this game comes from. All these guys in today's game, I'll say from maybe five years ago up until where it's going to go, are living – playing, breathing off the shoulders of Bob Cousy, Wilt Chamberlain, Bob Pettit, players that came in. Then you just go through the decades as you come up with Jerry West, Wilt Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor. These guys are making money, making, having fame with the way that we used to play the game. And for him to call out, and you know what? I hate Larry Bird, but I respect the hell out of that man because I went against him in all those championships and during the year. I, I, all we did as the Lakers is thought about the Boston Celtics. When our season began, yeah, we had to play the Seattles, the, the Phoenixes, the, all those teams. But our main goal was to prepare, uh, sharpen ourselves up because the Celtics were the team that we had to beat. And I can honestly say, knowing the late, great Dennis Johnson, we ate, Dennis and I were very good friends. Grew up here in Los Angeles, him playing for – he used to say the same thing. Coop, you know what? We knew we had to go to Cleveland and, and, and Philadelphia, and it, but we knew to win the championship, we had to play against the Lakers. So the respect that we've had for one another is immense. It's, it's, it's uh, legendary. Uh, you know, that's, I live and breathe and gauge my career – by my battles with Larry Bird and our battles with the Boston Celtics. So, you know, for guys to kind of compare, because basketball is the same. The only thing about the basketball now is the players change. You know, you go through the air, and I, I, I always say this, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, you cannot say those guys' names separately. You have to say those. When you say Larry Bird, you got to say Magic Johnson. When you say Magic Johnson, you got to say Larry Bird because they're the ones that set the NBA. In the 60s and 70s, basketball was just an America's game. It was America's game, and that's it. From the East Coast to the West Coast, from the North to the South, it was just America. 
Now you bring in Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, and they popularized popular popularized the game and made it more popular and famous to be uh, an American citizen, American basketball player. Then you go from the middle 80s to late 80s, and then you come into the 90s where Michael Jordan became the player, and Michael Jordan took us global. He took us international. The long pants, you know, the longer shorts, the tongue sticking out, the more athleticism. And now as we see basketball, basketball is a worldwide uh, uh, a fun game to be played no matter where you are in this world. And for people to compare, especially this guy, J.J. Reddick, for players to kind for him to be saying things like that is just, um, you know, you're supposed to be a lover of this game or, or, or a student of the game. How can you say that about one of the greatest players to ever play this game and not have played against Larry Bird? To say that Steph is getting more contact, man, that guy has no clue of how basketball was played in the 80s. And I guarantee you this, J.J. Reddick, if you had played in the 80s, this is Michael Cooper talking, I'd have locked your ass up. You wouldn't have got a shot off. You wouldn't have got nothing off. You had spent more time on the bench than on the floor. When I was on the floor, you couldn't have played when I was on the court. And I'm telling you that. Cool. Uh, so the main, I, I, my, I have been so outspoken on this. You were overseas when it happened. I felt the need to, kind of rally not the bird needs my defense but you're my friend you don't need my defense either it speaks for itself but I felt the need to kind of pinpoint you because you're the guy Larry Bird said was the toughest man to ever defend him people could say oh they only saw each other twice a year no I'm sorry for like four years you saw each all you guys nine times a year plus all the preseason games you guys played and had fights in the preseason games but his argument is and in my opinion Bird is probably a fringe top five three-point shooter right if you're bringing in today's players, but it's his dismissive attitude and the way that he kind of looks at Mad Dog like, what are you, nuts? So let me ask you this. He says he, on pin downs, on curls, which Larry Legend was, and you know this better than anybody, No, he ran off picks like amazing. Max always tells the story about <clears throat> him coming off a, a, a curl and, or going into a curl and him saying, screaming at Max, pick Cooper because you were so draped all over him that there was no way they could get, he could get open, but he doesn't even recognize the fact that birds, ball fakes, pump fakes movement without the ball running people into picks that has to be accounted for. And why maybe some of those shots were open, but Coop, the first thing that came to my face, my mind when I heard this was and you actually weren't in the play. It was 87 worthy ripping his Jersey off. I mean, he stuck to him like glue Bird breaks free, and who does he shoot it over? Michael Thompson, who that would have been called a foul today in today's rules. Michael Thompson hit his arm, and he hits that three-point shot. That kind of sums it up. Now, let me ask you this. How much did you guys, Pat Riley, Coach Riley, you know, prepare you? And this is going to sound like a stupid question, but I think young fans need to hear this. Prepare you for guys like, for Larry Bird when you were in the finals. You know what, Nick, the one thing about, Coach Riley, and I've always said this about him. Yeah, he was a taskmaster. He <laughs> ran the shit out of us. He did all that. But he was, when the playoffs started, and especially when we got to the finals and we saw the Boston Celtics, his attention to detail was better than any, well, I've only played for him, well, a couple of coaches, but Pat Riley was my main coach for any coach I've ever been around. I mean, we knew what play when they call four down, three out, 33 C, we, whatever it was okay. to get Larry open, we knew zipper, whatever, yeah. we knew where the ball was going to go. And that's what made Larry larger than life because he knew that we knew that he was going to get the basketball. And when he came off a down pick and they picking me and Kareem or Worthy, we stepped out on him. Larry always had, let, let, let me see. Let, yeah, please. This is one thing. This is one thing I, I, I said, you know, Larry never really talked to me, but one particular in the 85, you know, the 84 series, <clears throat> we're playing in the, in, the, in the forum. And this particular play down is a timeout, and they're coming down. And Larry gets me at the top of the key, and he's walking me underneath his basket. He goes, Cooper, I'm ready to wear your ass out. What? Okay, I get down to my best defensive stance. He goes down the lane. He comes off the left side, and Robert Parrish sets a pick. Great picker. Great picker. Come off, and we knew the play. We knew what was coming up. 
And Kareem was ready. And as Larry comes off the pick, shoulder to shoulder with Parrish, and I'm trailing behind him, he catches the basketball right about the elbow. And he gets the ball and he goes up and Kareem stops him from turning the corner. Larry catches the ball. He goes up in the air and here I come. And I'm like, I'm getting ready to smash this shit, man. So I jump up and I got my hand. And I don't know how Larry got this ball between Kareem and I. Because Kareem had his hands up. I'm coming with my right hand. because, And he hit a great pass. I, I, like I said, I don't know how he got it to him. Hits Robert Parrish for a roll to the basket and Robert dunks it. And Larry looks over his shoulder at me and he laughs. He said, I told you, motherfucker. (laughs) (laughs) That right there, uh, that that shows you the essence and who this guy was. He was about team. He's about winning. He's about making plays. And you know what? If anybody in today's game, Carmelo Anthony, who's no longer in this game here, maybe Kevin Durant, maybe Steph Curry comes off that, they forced that shot up there. They mm-hmm. try to get the shot off, but that's the difference between Larry. That play right there softens you up for the next time. Now Kareem's not going to jump out. Now Larry's wide open to shoot the ball. So people don't know and understand the dynamics of basketball and when great players, you know, the game comes so simple to us and the layman's person that's sitting down, the armchair guy is sitting there and he goes, wow, what a great pass. They don't know the, pro- the process of what that play has developed now. That play now has taken Kareem out of the action so Larry can really come off and hit that shot because I'm trailing behind him. So, you know, and J.J. Reddick should know that kind of stuff. You know that because you you made a living. That's how you got open with Orlando with guys setting good picks for your ass and you coming off wide open because you damn sure couldn't get open one-on-one and beat anybody. And that was shown when you were with the Clippers. That's why they traded you on to the next team. So those kind of plays and those kind of instances is where – I would expect former players to really understand that and not make judgment because this game is beautiful. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the game today. It's not as as fun. It's not as artistic, but it's still a good basketball game. These guys are very good shooters. Steph Curry. uh, I can't wait to uh, see Durant get back and play with Mm -hmm. Phoenix because they're going to show them that's a whole nother beast in the, in the West now. And it's, Another team that the Lakers have to contend with. But these comparisons that are made, let that be made by the fans that have never played this game. Let them argue about that because you can always say, oh, they don't know. They ain't never played this game. They ain't been out of the court. But for a former player, and we all make our comparisons, but I try not to, you but really I do. never, ever discount another player at any decade. You know, Bob Cousy was a hell of a player for his decade. And he was a player that now that I think the way they call the game now, Bob Cousy would be a great point guard in our league, our game today. So don't, uh, you know, yeah, we hammer him, JJ. I still have respect for him because 15 years in this league has some kind of merit to it. You know, anybody that plays one or two for 15 years, but you know what, watch your mouth, man, when you're talking about former players and who can do this and who can do that. Because this game, the game changed in the 80s because it was so physical. They had to stop that. Remember, I was watching the a tape the other day with Dr. J and Larry Bird. Them yeah. trying to come out of the East and Doc pounded Bird. <laughs> How about Red coming out on the court? Red was out on the court. Red Auerbach comes down like him and keep Billy Cunningham you know or something. Doc is the most mild mannered person, man. <laughs> and, and to see him get robbed, but you know what? We were fighting for championship. They knew they had to beat the Celtics to come out the East. And the two times they did, they lost one time and then they came back the next year and beat us. So it was a dog fight, man. And you know what, Ooh. Dominique, you know, guys that probably never got a good opportunity to play for a championship, it's because you had to go through so much. But the Atlanta Hawks were oh, Barkley reckoned with. Uh, coming in. So, you know, um, I'm not going to give him too much of a pass because, but I'll give him a pass because I think he got out of this. JJ Reddick is people talking, saying out his name. And, you know, this is a big deal. You know, hey, we give it to you. But you know what, dude? Watch your mouth, man. One more minute. So let me ask you this now. Those, because he used the phrase, I, Larry Bird took most of his distance threes with no one within five feet. Now, I, first of all, I think that's a silly comment, but it did happen. But wasn't that a product of the fact that if you played up on Bird there, it was like the lesser of two evils. If you played up tight on him behind the three, he's going to pump fake you, not you necessarily, but an average defender that in that era, pump fake you, drive, either get a mid-range jumper or a great pass 
I mean, this man was one of the greatest passing forwards ever. So, like, I would think it's a lesser of two evils. Like, the Celtics back then, and no one knows this better than you, but they used to always establish post-game to open up their perimeter game, right? Like, they'd start hammering into McHale and Parrish and Max, so that way they could be open from the outside. Yes, there was less spacing, but that does not mean it was less physical. Like, that's I think that's what it all comes down to. In order to get to the point where you're open for a three, a oh, um, you're usually going through a gamut of, of physicality back then. I mean, taking all the, because this is what the young people love to say. Taking all the fighting, including the Dr. J, everything. Pretend that the NBA was as stringent today with fighting, not physicality, with fighting as it is now, right, back then. So take all the fighting away. Was the game still more physical without, you know, the occasional brawl? Oh, for sure. Still right. physical. I think you, you know, uh, what was a finesse team for Phoenix? Alvin Adams, uh, Danny Ainge, when he was there, Dennis Johnson was there. They weren't considered a physical team. I mean, a, a, a roughhouse team, but they were still very physical. There was a lot of uh, more activeness on the pick and roll play. Uh, our, our goal in the 80s, and this is one thing Pat Riley used to say, and I tell today's players, that, you know, the kids I, I'm around and I coach AAU and my high school team, championships are won in the paint mm -hmm. because that's a high percentage shot down there. So you couldn't let Robert Parrish, Larry Bird, Kevin McHale get in the low post. We were, you know, Magic Johnson was not a good one on, he wasn't he wasn't a good one on one defensive player defensive player but he was a great double teamer. Mm -hmm. We used to have him double team. Magic was He's a so big tall. double, six nine, yeah. long, and whoever. So those guys had to pass it out. So you have to look at our three point shooting as opposed to now. Now it's a little bit more of a weapon. Back then it was a weapon to open up the back the paint so you had to, so they can go back down inside. So it wasn't necessarily a weapon because we wanted to beat you inside. We wanted to shoot. In today's game, guys have no problem with their team field goal percentage being 41, 40%, 38%. Back in, back in our days, 80, we wanted to shoot 55% from the field. So that was getting the ball inside for the sky hook, the Magic Johnson baby hook, Kevin McHale fall away, Cedric Maxwell doing putting in work down there because nobody was on guard in guys one-on-one. -on -one. They were going to score, so you had to double team them, which made the three-point shot become – a little bit more of a weapon. That's where Danny Ainge, Kyle Macy, yeah. uh, 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 kid, uh, Come on, uh, Mark Fred. Price, Mark Price, you, Mark you, Price, you, you, what? You. Well, yeah, and me, you know, that made us better. Uh, that really opened up our offense. So it, it's um, um, really amazing to see. And that's the one thing I love about the game, the transformation of the game from there. And uh, uh, from our era to it is now, I watched the game yesterday, Philly and Boston. That was a good game. And you know what? Again, I don't like the Boston Celtics. I hate them, but you got to give them guys respect, man, because they fucking bring it every – you know what? That Tatum and Brown and the other players that they surround themselves with, they made themselves a force to be reckoned with. And the one thing that you got to realize why Boston is such a good team this year, Tatum was having a terrible game. And they were still in that game. They were yeah. still in the game. You had a Smart and all these guys. And then for uh, what's the coach's name? The new coach, uh, Joe Mazzulla. Yeah, not call you know timeout. People talk about that guy being thirty-four years old, oh. young coach. And that was a veteran. Yes, it was Popovich, uh, Red Arback, a Pat Riley. That last play he drew up. That was masterful, and I kept saying, why does he have Tatum all the way in, in the backcourt? Back like, how is he going to get him the ball? And next thing you know, Tatum got the ball. He's knocking down a three. So this game is, is beautiful. Gorgeous. I love it. It has involved, and it not only has it involved from the players, but it has involved from the coaches. Anywhere else, this guy is a, a video assistant sitting, sitting somewhere behind the other guy. Here he is leading the team, but you know what? I guarantee he'll say this. I've watched all the video, and I guarantee that guy has watched some games from the 80s, oh, maybe the 70s with the Celtics because he knows the legacy that he's trying to guide now. But he has to keep that going. And uh, while I'm talking about 
to Boston. Let me mention my Lakers out here. <laughs> Who, with the trades they made, the man, Lakers are getting ready to do something. I really do believe this is something uh, spectacular because they three and a half, three and a half behind the sixth spot. They're on a three-game road trip starting the day. They got Dallas, OKC, and somebody else down the line. Lakers getting ready to get in. I really wish they could get into the sixth spot to be in the playoffs, but they're going to get into that play-in spot. And if the Lakers get into the play-in spot, Watch out. healthy. They got to be healthy. Yeah. So they got that boy Michael Beasley, ben, Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. I, they got some young kids now mm -hmm. that can score without LeBron being on the floor. And they showed that against the Golden State Warriors the other night where LeBron went and sat down. This yeah. team kept rolling, yeah. kept playing. D'Angelo Russell, not a big fan of his, but I love him now. Uh, like Only because he's a left-hand player. I don't like, I'm not big on left-hand players. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but he's come in and the kid has shown when the Lakers drafted him, Byron Scott and him back in the day, is that he can score and he's a hell of a passer. Obviously, our key for the Lakers is not to be AD's health, but I can see if AD goes down for a game or two and not a long stretch, mm -hmm. Lakers will be able to hold up the ship. So be We're careful, helping. people, because you might see a Lakers Celtic championship this year. And I could, we are praying for that in Boston. And I can tell you this there will be no disparaging of the legends amongst Celtics and Lakers players. There never is, because we know that Jason Tatum is now on a – Jalen Brown are on a list that is – they are probably at the bottom of that list because they've not won a title yet. And you know what, LeBron, even Kobe, those guys celebrated the past. I don't know where this happened. I think it happened with Charles Barkley and Shaq, and I love them. I love when they are outspoken about it, but I think that's what's gotten the young younger generation pissed off. I can understand that, but there's no reason to be disrespectful. Right. I mean, Dominique didn't call uh, Reddick an idiot. He said the statement was idiotic. Right. No one uh, no one ever really disrespected except for to say, as a preference, I enjoyed it better when they shot less threes, things like that. Right. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think, Coop, your your resume certainly speaks for itself. Larry Bird certainly speaks for itself. And you had to guard him and the man who rarely dishes out a compliment to an opponent. And even in retirement at that during that interview said the hardest defender. Now, keep in mind, you're four inches shorter, about 40 pounds lighter. 20. Oh, no, about 60. Larry 60. got bigger. Well, <laughs> yeah, Larry was big. 60 pounds lighter. You're not. So you're not uh, nearly as as uh, physically big as him. And he calls you. And I went back after yesterday because I was obsessed because, you know, you hit me up and I'm looking at plays where you're guarding him and Mike Gorman or Johnny Most are saying he can't breathe Larry Bird. Red Auerbach almost beat the officiating crew up in 87 because of the way you guys were guarding him in game four or game. Yeah, when they lost game four. I mean, it's on tape. It, you know, so I think that to say that the defense with all this switching now and and zones and all this other stuff, the defense comparative, it, it can't be compared. It can't be compared. I just don't think so. And look at the scoring today. I mean, the other night, I, two teams scored 175 to 174. That was Absolutely like Michael, disgraceful. It's disgraceful Absolutely for disgraceful. somebody, a, a defensive player of the year to see that. man. Come on. You, you don't know whether that was poor defense or great offense. I, I mean, it was one or the other. I mean, it, from a, a fan's perspective, and you like scoring, I mean, that had to be good. But I'll say this about that one game, yeah. Nick, is that the, uh, uh, the, the Clippers mm -hmm. and Sacramento, I watched the first half of that game. There was some good defense. It wasn't like guys didn't have their hand up and they were just standing there. I mean, you have one of them a great defender and Kawhi Leonard out there on the court. So he had his hand up. That was just some fantastic shots hit. But, uh, yeah, that that was uh, – that hurt my heart because as a defensive player, you want to see some defense. The All-Star game. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Really, that's what it is. Like so the All-Star game was terrible. I hated that. Terrible. I, didn't watch that. I watched the first two two minutes. Me literally, too. And the two last minutes, two minutes. And I after. turned it off and watched something else. But, uh, again, to close this out, uh, J.J. Reddick, yeah, just just uh, appreciate okay. the game. Uh, don't talk about the game too much. And again, quit trying to compare because everybody's gonna do that. When I do that, I don't try to compare too much.
because I appreciate this game and basketball is evolved. It's going to change. The game is still the same. It's the players that are evolving and making it bigger yes. and better sports. And with that, Nick, Michael Cooper is out of here because I got to go get my team up to practice. I love you. Fans, thank you so much. Uh, stay tuned. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. And I'm sorry I got a little rough on JJ. But again, I tell you, if I had to see him out on the court, he would feel this roughness instead of just hear about it. 